Hello and welcome to the special, a special session of the Russia Question. My name is Michael Osorian. I'm the director of the Russian program at Fordham University and host of the Russia Question that you're watching. This webinar is one of the many initiatives of the Orthodox Christian Studies Center at Fordham University. The Fordham Center facilitates, funds, and publishes scholarship on the Orthodox Christian world broadly understood. To learn more about the center, its initiatives, or publications, please visit the website at www.fordham.edu slash orthodoxy. We would also encourage you to follow us on YouTube and to share this and other videos with anyone who might benefit from it. Um, Today's session, like I mentioned, is a special session because uh, we're inviting students uh, in place of scholars and they're uh, brave and intelligent students who are willing to discuss with us uh, what's happening in Russia now and some cultural differences, differences between um, growing up in Russia and growing up in, in America. So I'll allow them to introduce themselves uh, and then we'll begin talking. At any point, if you find something interesting or if you have something interesting to say, then you can enter your question into the Q&A and I'll pick it up and we'll um, continue it uh, in, in our conversation. Helen, please, then Paulina. All right. Um, hi, my name is Helen. I'm originally from Russia. I come from a I'm half percent Russian, half percent, uh, fifty percent Ukrainian. Um, my dad is in Kiev, Ukraine. Um, my mom and my brother they're in Veliki Novgorod, Russia, right now. And I'm an international studies major. Thank you. Hi. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Polina. I'm also fifty percent Russian, fifty percent Ukrainian. Um, but my Ukrainian side of the family actually comes from Luhansk, uh, the occupied territories. They obviously are not there anymore. Uh, so basically all of my like nuclear family relatives are in Moscow and nearby kind of like smaller towns. Um, mm -hmm. and I'm a film and visual arts major. Great. Um, well, thank you again for joining us, and I'm interested in just having a conversation with both of you, so uh, feel free to jump in at any point if something uh, springs to mind, okay? Um, I suppose we could begin with how your, how your families are faring. What are you up against right now? Do you speak with your family regularly? What do you talk about? What have you talked about latest? Mm -hmm. Helen, go ahead. Um, all right. So, well, first of all, let's start with my dad because he's in Kiev right now. And it's been extremely difficult to talk to him right now, especially for the last, you know, month. Because, you know, on the one hand, there is a war going on and there are not so many things that we can discuss except for the actual war. On the other hand, I'm trying my best to support him and sometimes I just cannot find the right words. And, you know, I'm not going to discuss weather with him because, you know, he has like mo definitely more important things to care about at the moment. And speaking of my Russian side of the family, well, it's also been kind of difficult to, to, to discuss these things with my mom because she's, uh, as she's in Russia and she's surrounded by people by a lot of people who actually support Putin and as a person who opposes this whole Z movement she is furious about what's happening and so I'm just you know a liaison here in this situation who just you know I'm just here to support them and do whatever I can to you know somehow improve this this situation. Okay yeah thank you Helen and Paulina. Hi have obviously all of my relatives are safe so I don't have the like hardship of dealing with like you know my relatives being in an active war zone um what's interesting about my family is I guess it represents the entire like spectrum of like do we support Putin or do we think he's literally just like leading everyone to ruin and he that he's like a murder killer a murderer killer etc yeah. 
on the like how do you converse with those that you disagree with in your family on this issue so it's like only i actually i mean i only talk to like my immediate family really like my mom my dad my grandma my mom was like well my mom and me share the same opinions so there's not like much disagreement there um with my dad it's more complicated in that although he is definitely against what is happening he seems to think it's like there's this like saying that has become very popular uh, in these days in Russia which is me so like it's not all like you should look at both sides of the coin kind of like so my dad thinks that like because Russia is a propaganda machine then the US and everyone else are also propaganda machines which to a certain extent like yes they're true if you look at Fox News like I mean but the only like the difference is that in the US and in Europe who have been like criticizing this people have access to multiple media outlets with different opinions which allows them to form their own like opinions uh mm-hmm. and my dad seems to think that that is not the case that um basically all the media are saying more or less right the same thing and that he thinks that uh some of my for example like i like um i would say that i support the US and Europe giving armaments to Ukraine but my dad is like they're just prolonging and extending the war they should be talking with Putin and I'm like but yeah. don't, but like at this point I feel like Putin cannot be re- like he has proven that he cannot be reasoned with because I feel like if he could be reasoned with it's kind of like it's kind of like if people in the middle of World War II were like oh, let's just sit down with Hitler and have a nice little chat like yeah, yeah right um, yeah, he hasn't proven conversation worthy so there's right. that They're trustworthy mm-hmm. but then there's my grandmother uh because i've been basically trying to teach my parents about forms of like safe protests where you don't get arrested like for example writing on money or like putting up signs like stuff that you won't necessarily like get caught for and my mm-hmm. grandma calls me and is like paulina you can't do anything you will get arrested like first of all in my grandmother there's a deep-seated fear that you can get arrested for basically thinking which That's makes super sense. interesting yeah because yeah. she like caught the like the end of stalin's regime she like she was born while stalin was still yes. alive yet at the same time she fully thinks that putin is a like a national he- hero because right. on one hand at the beginning of the war she said this is wrong this needs to be stopped and at the beginning of the war i saw her like question it and i was like mm-hmm. oh this is good but then the more the war went on and the more like because in the beginning of the war like i don't think the officials in russia themselves expected there to be a war so they did not really have like a united front of propaganda to cover it with in the first three days which is when you saw even my grandma question it but yeah. then they started then they literally outlawed saying like no to war they made that like a criminal statement yes. an extremist statement and after that you see my grandma like literally migrating back to her point of view that like NATO is an evil force that was going mm-hmm. to exterminate Russians they were yeah. going to send like radioactive pigeons or something uh, like yeah, yeah, yeah. Really <laughs> well, so so this brings up a really interesting difference between censorship um in Russia versus censorship in America and you spoke about that a little bit already right there in a way for me very difficult to compare um like you mentioned i i've heard um and you read about sort of um certain circles in America, particularly on the extreme right, who were concerned about censorship uh, on Instagram, on Facebook, um, on YouTube. And it has to do with sort of, with, with theories that have not been proven except by certain people in a certain group, right? Um, like you say, uh, 
there, the war is not a, a, a conspiracy. Everyone all over the world agrees that it's occurring multiple independent uh, news stations and we have access to all of it, right? Um, and that's a major difference. I was uh, wondering, Helen, can you speak about uh, the difference between the two? Since what is it like to be censored in Russia versus uh, how you're censored here, if you are at all? Mm -hmm. All right, so here I feel like there is more of a, this idea of, you know, this some sort of like social responsibility. So for example, like, let's say that sometimes at Fordham, I think that some of the people who are like, let's say, hold Republican views, sometimes they're kind of like too scared to admit the fact like publicly that they support the Republican Party, which is kind of like, I can understand that because, you know, the majority of people at Fordham, they are uh, more of a, you know, liberal state of mind and they kind of support the Democratic Party. Uh, we And then at the, at, in Russia, it's a completely different story because in America here, we have, no matter what views you have, you can still discuss them you can still you know you know use social media to talk about these things and to uh, you know argue with people and you know in, engage in different debates in russia you cannot do that uh in russia you can get arrested for liking an anti-government post you can um my mom for example like on the 8th of march she posted some of um some stories that basically said no war peace to ukraine freedom to russia and she got a police officer coming to her apartment being like well you know what we're checking like social media right now so you better you know stay away from these things and this kind of like just you know well thank god she was not arrested on the other hand this is there was like a clear hint that she should stop and that's the difference and therefore, I would like to say like a very big thanks to all of my Russian friends who are joining our conversation today because I think this is yes, a, welcome. Yeah, this is a sign of them protesting against this censorship that they are facing in Russia. Because if you do not support support Putin publicly in Russia, you can you lose your job, you you can lose your work, you can you you lose your apartment, you use you basically kind of lose everything. And that's the difference. So well put. And um, it reminds me of a couple of things. One is, well, for those of us who are now reading, just got finished reading Master and Margarita, we talked a lot about Aesopian language. That is, you're speaking about one thing, maybe mildly or on the surface, but beneath it, you mean something not mild at all, right? Something of serious consequence. Um, and that's a sort of thing that evolved to test people that you didn't trust or people that you thought maybe were enemy of, enemies of the state. And I want to pull back to something that Kalina said, um, which reminded me of an interview that Masha Gason did with Ezra Klein. She said that basically you talked about how your grandmother changed the way that she thought, right? Well, Masha Gason pointed out that in Russia, when... Uh, state media reaches a certain point of saturation, then it prevents those people from doing thinking, from actually thinking at all. So, so when we take polls, it's in fact very difficult to find out what those people think because they're not taught to think. Um, and if they don't know what they think, then how can we find out, right? Do you think that's a fair sort of difference? That is, when we're talking not about you know, not, a, not about people your age who have access to other uh, forms of media and news sources, but maybe someone who really buys the state uh, uh, news lines completely. What do you think? Is that fair, Polina? I think it is a fair assessment because previously like prior to this argument with my grandma i mean we've had the argument about like actually we fought about stalin before because um i was studying for like my high school exams and i was doing like a human history of the ussr and i said that like stalin was basically like using slave like prison slave labor to like lift up the country from its like knees 
And that really set my grandma off on like a on like a tangent about how Stalin was the only good thing about the USSR and then all the others that came after him slowly ruined the country and then like Putin is now the the great save right so it's like I feel like there's only I feel like Putin really carefully constructed this propaganda mission it has been constructing it for years in that I feel like if this happened in 2009, people's reactions would be probably very different because as we remember in, I think, when there was this big movement against faked like election results, I think it was, Helen, which year? It was like 2013, 14. Do you remember which year it was? 2012. 2012. Yeah, like 20, 2012. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, in 2012, people, like, like, because right now, no one, basically, some people are protesting, but there is no, like, mass protest, which is partly connected to the fact that this is now very much, like, criminally persecuted. But also, I feel like in 2012, more people were ready to believe that, like, the government was not, like, the ultimate force of good that can do no evil i feel like mm -hmm. more people were still like thinking critically mm -hmm. because i feel like in the like when the ussr first fell apart i feel like there was like a genuine attempt in the media and everywhere to establish like a state that would like well, first of all, like a fairer state, but second of all, like a media machine that would represent different aspects and opinions and different mm -hmm. like uh, points of view. But that mm -hmm. slowly became erased. And the more it got erased, um, people who were not taught media literacy, which is basically like everyone who grew up in the Soviet Union went through the like um the soviet school system which did not teach you critical thinking so like people like of my grandma's age especially since like she was a worker at a factory so she did not receive any further like education i think she finished either nine grades or maybe eight or something like that mm -hmm. people who like have not learned it's very hard to learn the skill of critical thinking when you're 60 Although it is possible, and I'm not saying that my grandma is, like, without her fault. Like, I think she, because my mom told me, like, oh, it's, like, you should be nicer to her. It's so hard to, like, change your mind when you're 60. I'm like, that doesn't mean that you should not be making an effort to do that. However, right. I, like, I definitely understand that, like, it's not, when she says these things, it's not really her saying them. It's literally, mm -hmm. like, Russian TV talking to me through her. Wow. And, and like you said, it's not her that, it's not her original response, which is a humane response, right? But when she's taught what to think about it, then she's, then it changes, right? I mean, it's so interesting. And what you say about uh, the elections and the protests and the uh forces that that shut down the protests reminds me of of the amanovsky in general and it's you know those are the basically uh putin's in putin's enforcers right and i read an article about them they're very consciously kept apart from society from what i understand um uh, and that's, you know, on purpose, they, they move from town to town, uh, or that they are moved from town to town, rather, so that they don't develop ties to the people in the area. Just, I'm curious, what has been your interaction with, with Amanotsu, with the enforcers? Do you know about them outside of their roles? Uh, do you know their families and, and, and that sort of thing? Or is it completely uh, separate? Uh, Helen, would you start? Right. Um, well, my kind of like the only encounter with Amonovsky was uh, when I realized that, so, you, you know, as in Russia, we had Polizia, then we have Milizia, then we have Rosgvardia, then we have uh, Amonovsky. And 
uh, you know, I feel like every year we are getting something new here. We are getting new, some new police forces, some new mil- militarized police forces, which is even worse, which is which is basically Rosguardia. And, yeah. you know, basically, when, especially in St. Petersburg, you can see a lot of these people just, you know, being on guard and, you know, just trying to, you know, check the situation, whatever. Uh, my only problem with that, with, you know, not the only problem, but my main problem with that is that I know that these people basically can do whatever they want, uh, that they have this whole complete monopoly on violence and no matter, and I, I saw, you can basically on social media, you can see many, many innocent people, like old women getting beaten up by them just because for example, like one specific video I'm thinking of right now is one woman whose son was arrested during the Navalny protest. She came to Tula Monovsi and she asked them like, oh, why was my son arrested? And then she was beaten up for that, for asking one simple question. She wasn't showing any, you know, like uh, violent resistance. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And this is my biggest problem. I'm trying to avoid these people when I see them. I have absolutely no you know, trust in them. I, I, I'm not sure whether I, I know that, you know, for sometimes, for example, when they need to, you know, for the statistics, sometimes they need to arrest people. They can basically just, you know, give you drugs and fake the whole case. And this is very common in, in my uh, small town, Veliki Novgorod. And for example, the last time it happened, it really happened in front of my eyes. That was uh, the September uh, before I left to go to the United States, that happened. And, you know, you cannot do anything about that. And, you know, the good thing if your parents have money and they can, you know, pay these people and, you know, give Zyatka uh, and that's it. Right, uh, yeah. Yeah, but if if not, then you're in trouble, and that's about it. Pavlina, do you have uh, something to add to this? Or? Yeah, I only feel like Zatkas will soon stop working because Putin's regime is like it is it is corrupt, but I feel like. Now that it's like moving in to become like an absolutely totalitarian state, where like basically all the non state sponsored media got banned uh, Mm -hmm. or are on the verge of being banned um, and closed down, I feel like now if you're suspected in like anti-governmental activity or anything that would like sabotage Putin's um like rule over media like I feel like Avzatka like I feel like Avzatka would not no longer cut it yeah like I feel like if you're arrested no matter how much money you have like and I think brutality has been increasing like there have been like there has been a voice recording going around the internet of a woman who participated in the protests getting like violently beat up in the like police department for just going out and protesting. So this is the kind of culture that you were accustomed to, but it has increased in violence uh, recently, right? And I just want to sort of give our students maybe a sense for what it's like to live under these conditions. Um, I know also it's on my mind because we've been reading it, but um, one of the themes in Master Margarita is that uh, the idea that cowardice is the chief virtue because it enables all of the other virtues, right? And we can sit here safely, freely and say, well, yeah, then, then, well, you know, why, why are Russians, why are Russians standing up? Why are they protesting more, even though there are some that do and have incredible respect for them? But it's one thing to, to say that when you're safe. It's another thing to say that when you can spend 15 years in jail or be brutally beaten or intimidated in other horrible ways uh, and have to, you know, 15 years in jail. It's not just about you, it's about your family. Um, so, Helen, would you tell us a little bit about growing up in that kind of culture? I mean, you had a, a kind of experience that was similar to that we discussed before. Uh, would you share that with us? 
Yeah, sure. So, um, I mean, the first point that I would like to emphasize that even like for this conversation before it actually happened, uh, I, well, I talked to my mom and my mom was like, please do not share it publicly with anyone. Like, don't and tell don't. anyone about <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah. yeah, okay. And I think that's like, important. This kind of like shows you the mentality that people in Russia have because that's enough in a way. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. Um, speaking of, you know, losing everything when you are not in some, you know, some sort of agreement with your government, I think my dad is a perfect illustration of that because um, my dad in the 90s he had his own factory that was producing different metals etc for the nuclear plants in Russia and when Putin kind of like became our new dictator what happened was that there was a like some sort of like mass consolidation of all the factories and like you know big businesses in Russia and people and people from the government basically came to my dad and they were like, well, you either share your business with us or you're in trouble. And one specific uh, affiliation that, you know, still kind of like still works in Russia is Alpha Bank, uh, which is directly linked to this case uh, because Alpha Bank uh, was is a pro- governmental institution in Russia, and basically they're directly responsible for what I'm about to tell you next. Because what happened next was that uh, my dad was accused of murdering more than twenty people, and you know if you Google my dad's full name, basically in Russian you will see a lot of you know articles about how bad he is about him him being literally called a bloody killer and just completely made up <laughs> yeah right and you know and my dad needed to you know run away from russia and uh you know seek political asylum in ukraine he lived without any documents for more than 10 years because he, basically the russian government made such a big deal out of it to you know teach everyone else that, you know this lesson that basically you need to share with your government Right. That, share means allow us to steal from you <laughs> yeah. right exactly and yeah and you know it only after you know only when he sent his case to london and people there they you know they investigated this whole case once again they were like oh but this is completely fabricated this is not real this just cannot be true and basically this is these are the conditions that my family needed to live in and you know so for example like my dad what is especially powerful right now i asked him um yesterday about you know what uh, what is your main reason of going back to ukraine and you know just you know being there right now being in kiev when the war is happening and my dad said one very important thing that i would like to share with uh, you know all of us here and that was that you know um that was basically that you know ukraine needs peace but you know if ukraine wins this war and putin actually falls and he is no longer the dictator in russia then you know russia will achieve freedom and he and by fighting in ukraine he's also fighting for all of the russians who want to live in a normal civil society amazing absolutely amazing I've, that kind of courage is just astounding. Um, and uh, along those lines, uh, one of our guests, John Spade, doesn't have a question, but just wants to express his gratitude to Helen Kalina for taking time to speak with us and being brave enough to share their experiences. Uh, so that's to you guys. It's, a, it's a really remarkable and uh, thank you. Uh, so I, I would like to know um, most recently, Paulina, what what do you what is a day to day day like? How do you sort of keep in touch with your your family, and how do you help them to find things out, or how do they find things out? Um. Well, I like I think like my parents are thankfully like media literate. There is the fight that I have going on with grandma, 
where mm-hmm. I try to send her like YouTube videos because she kind of well she has like my mom's old iPhone so she knows how to look up like recipes on YouTube but I don't think she like fully realizes that YouTube is not just like recipes and like weird celebrity gossip thing <laughs> yeah um yeah. so I've been sending basically yeah my main point of trying to con- to convince say let's say my grandma or even my dad that like I'm not that like the west isn't trying to lie and like this isn't all about like oil or whatever it is um is basically like sending them videos made by russian people from russia who disagree with this or people okay who they think are an authority like for example my dad likes akunin who's like a famous like contemporary russian writer so i send him like an akunin interview that he recently did on like a popular like interview channel mm-hmm. about mm-hmm. the situation um but what terrifies me is that like Russia will try to cuz it already it already closed down like Facebook and Instagram. So I feel like it will soon move on onto YouTube because there have been like some attempts to close it down, but I feel like once that closed down, my, my grandma does not know how to use a VPN. She will not be able to watch it. Like I mean obviously I will teach her how to use a VPN and stuff, but like Right. For many people I, our family is more like the exception than the rule, like in mm-hmm. the country, because both in of terms of being media literate, you mean? Yeah, because my, my dad holds like a master's degree in economics from the university, wait, Mugimo Moskovsky Kusudarsky Institute. Uh, what is that in international relations right international relations so even though he was studying like kind of i mean i guess he was studying while the ussr was falling apart so i think like them both of them attaining like that level of education has le- has definitely led them to understanding it at least economically so my dad at least is able to understand that russia is economically currently absolutely dying yeah whereas like people who have sort of like not been privileged to like attend universities uh and like working class families a living for example not in big cities where you have access to different kinds of people but say in like smaller towns maybe mm-hmm. um they just like they don't understand economics so they will just believe that when putin says oh it's okay we don't really need international trade um <laughs> they yeah. they're like okay they go with it yeah cuz they just think that the soviet union was also like a self-sustaining like capsule government which was not true um so they will yeah well it's it's interesting that as you're speaking you know i think that we ha- the court has sort of a, a very understandable responses which is it's crazy that the kind of corruption that happens in movies is reality in russia right in other words that's how how different it feels i think uh sometimes uh just the norms between the two cultures are so Uh, different that it feels fantastical almost right like not unreal in a way and i want to turn to student questions there are a couple up please feel free to add uh, more at any time i of course have so many more questions <laughs> i doubt we'll run out though um one question from sofia uh palishuk who's uh, uh well I'll, I'll cover her story in a moment. Thank you for sharing your insight. She says you all spoke about censorship and critical thinking. Over the last few weeks, we have also seen pro-war protests from Russians living outside of Russia. In cities across Europe and even in Boston, where a painted Ukrainian flag was vandalized with the Nazi symbol. Do you have any insight into the reasoning of those who have access to diverse information who do not face 
who do not face persecution and who continue with this rhetoric? Excellent question. A tough one. You can, uh, something comes to mind for either of you? I mean, why do people support Trump when he says that immigrants are out there to steal people's jobs? Like, that's obviously untrue. And people who support that have, in theory, access to multiple points of view. I think a lot of Putin's, which is interesting because I'm writing, actually, I'm, I'm kind of writing about a similar line of thought for my film class because I'm analyzing the film Brat. Um, wow, yeah. which is like a proto-nationalist piece uh-huh. from the 90s, I would say. Uh-huh. Um, but that movie plays on a sense of like inferiority that Russian people were experiencing after the Soviet Union fell apart. Because for many people, the Soviet Union was this like glorious thing. And then you didn't have a glorious thing anymore and you felt right. kind of down. And like, you felt like you were this, like basically the scum of the earth, basically some like pitiful person living in a world stricken by poverty. And I feel like a lot of people who, um, a lot of people who are doing the pro-Russian protests aren't like the younger generation. I feel like they're people the age of say like my parents, or my grandparents that have migrated to Europe in the, with the first wave of people when like the USSR, USSR kind of fell down mm-hmm. and they started to emigrate out of there. So um, I feel like they also felt that kind of like thing where like, oh, our entire ideology has collapsed. And what Putin does is he offers a very convenient like ideology for a person to feel powerful again because like even yeah. in responding to a criticism of like if you were protecting us from nato then why isn't nato like attacking you now that you've committed all of those war crimes uh and instead of being like and instead of stating the real reason which is nato was never interested in an all-out conflict and would never have attacked russia in the first place because it knows that that would lead to terrible consequences. He twists it and he says, because now we have shown that Russia is a force to be reckoned with. We're a strong country, which is completely like out of line with reality because his, his, like, his encouragement of corruption has led to his own army stealing from him and resulting in like... <laughs> them using like 1980s military equipment yeah yeah it's the cracks in in both the organization and in the uh equipment as you say are showing right yeah i think it's the desire to feel powerful and to feel on the right side of things like no one wants to be from a country Mm. that is massacring people and committing genocide right I think it's them not wanting to, and it's definitely like, like that's on them. (laughs) Like, I'm not trying to justify them. I'm just saying that that's probably. It's a very interesting, uh, it's a very insightful response, I think. Yeah, nobody wants to be at the bottom of history. And so, you know, the, the fact that he gave them some sort of resilience with which to face the world it leaves a kind of patriotic feeling in their heart, right? Or something along those lines that, that they're attached to on an emotional level. Uh, that's, that's interesting. I think there are parallels in, uh, in America too, but Helen, did you want to respond to that? Um, or I should cover it? Yeah, Paulina definitely covered uh, the biggest chunk of it. Uh, just to, you know, emphasize your point, um, yeah, definitely the fact that, you know, kind of like this nationalism that kind of is this kind of like, oh, I would even call it fascism at this point. Basically, this the, it comes mm. from this blind desire not to be associated with all of the atrocities that are happening right now. No one wants to be from, you know, like a country that there is 
you know, seen as a bad country, that's they're seen as inhumane country. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, like you, you could say that, you know, for example, like if, let's say if you lived like uh, back uh, during World War II, then you wouldn't want to, you know, like after Germany lost, you wouldn't want to say that you are from Nazi Germany, but you know, like this is basically, and mm -hmm. people were like, they were trying to, you know, basically hide themselves from this truth. And this is what these people are doing. They don't want, they want to remain ignorant so that it kind of like functions as their, you know, like defense mechanism almost from this, you know, reality that, you know, in the very end, like who wants to be associated with all of these things? Because there is like this general understanding that war is bad. And so, you know, and now we need to, like the government basically needs to somehow twist this whole idea and to basically say that, you know, saying no war when there is like a special military operation is, you know, it's not a very good thing because you, you need to support your military. And you said, and you can definitely see how all of this, you know, like kind of like, slogans they basically get twisted and yeah and the, and basically people just you know they they kind of like they don't have anything else to you know believe in therefore they they just believe in putin because in the very end if they open their eyes they will realize that what russia is doing right now is very similar to what nazi germany was doing to you know the rest of the world yes and so in that sense it's a it's a form of denialism you right i mean interesting and um uh we have let's see another question from anatoly who asked do you see the 1990s period of oligarchy and criminality following the fall of the soviet union uh repeating if putin were to fall uh, would young russians today be able to live through such a period of struggle similar to what many of our russian soviet parents have experienced um so i th i think anatoly what he did was basically he kind of like raised a, the most important question that a lot of russians uh ask themselves today and basically you know we have this mentality in russia that that can be summarized as if not putin then who mm -hmm. and it kind of like shows this fear that you know if we do not have putin anymore then there there is going to be a new period that would that would be like very similar to the 90s um and well speaking of the 90s people have very i would say dual vision of this period of time because some people who were well let's say in power back then they kind of like see it as you know this you know very twisted but still an attempt to you know have this some sort of like democratic society because you finally don't have this you know soviet power you know this soviet big brother basically watching all the the rest of the society and then on the other hand you you can as Anatoly mentions that there, there are a lot of oligarchs and criminals and, you know, mafia uh, that kind of like get all the power and basically normal citizens, they just live in fear. Uh, and yeah, there, there is corruption going on, et cetera, et cetera. So in the very end, I would say that if Putin falls in Russia right now, I mean, if you think about it, there are some points in history where, you know, this argument that if not Putin, then who is no longer plausible just because of this understanding that if he remains in power, then what's going to happen to the country, then what's going to happen to the whole world? Because it's the scariest thing that your president can say is, why do we need the world if there is no Russia in this world? And this kind of like shows this logic that basically, you know, the 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 rest of the world is not is no longer needed if there is no Russia in this world. And if you have this sort of mentality and this view in 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 your mind, then you know 
it's it's extremely dangerous for the whole world and i can see why biden for example is so concerned about putin remaining in power because there is a that putin has made direct threats to the not only to the nato alliance but also to the whole world that there will yeah. be a danger of nuclear war and this well, is that- okay and this should not be tolerated and i feel like nowadays it's the time for the united states to kind of like show that you know this is the red line we will not longer tolerate you know this this type of you know rhetoric this type of logic etc from putin mm-hmm. because basically it it's it's just going to be the end of the world well it's interesting that um like you're pointing out you know he's he's justifying the invasion partially by saying he's defending countrymen from nazis because once you do that then everything is is justifiable right once you're fighting against nazis then everything is justifiable but it's an absurd claim we know right and um it's not to say that there isn't a fascist right wing in, in ukraine but that's not who he's protecting them from right um and it it makes me wonder you know just generally about rebranding like like you brought up the polizia before which is also a rebranding of what it was called before right milizia uh why would they not want it to be called milizia well because it's a militia <laughs> right but they don't want you to they don't want to make it that obvious that distinction right so a lot of a lot of renaming of things and more dangerously like you point out turning one side into complete evil right is the scariest thing because no matter what you do at that after that point you're justified in doing it right i think that we have a a similar sort of problem here where we demonize one side or the other uh, politically speaking but then there's a temptation in america to demonize all russians because they just live there right uh it's not everyone that's doing that but it happens here and there right um how about you have you faced some kind of um anti russian comments or or experiences in america or have you found people to be generally supportive alina go for it I have not faced any like anti-Russian sentiment at all. Um I know in like I know off cases. I think Helen has a case that she told me about um which she can speak on later. Uh but that was not even in America. Um mm. I think that if Trump got reelected, things would be a bit different because you basically have two fascists staring each other off. So I think if Trump was here we would be on a plane we would have be back in Russia I think deportation right. would right. have happened like it happened with um certain countries from in the Middle East that were banned from like mm-hmm. entering the US during the Trump era I believe um but right. even though he claims that that Putin wouldn't have invaded because they get along so well right <laughs> as if that has yeah. anything to um, do with it yeah mm-hmm. mostly i think what i found i think it is like actually some of the professors um like my screenwriting supervisor is going to be my like thesis advisor next year he was like very concerned when i told him from russia he's like like is your family okay which i feel like it's nice to feel concerned but i feel like first and foremost people should really be concerned about people in Ukraine and people who have relatives in Ukraine Absolutely. because they feel like I feel like it's it is very bad right now in Russia but people are not starving in basements yet and I think what Russia needs right now is not sympathy but encouragement to obviously it's very hard to encourage people to rebel against the state that can that will use real bullets on people if enough people mm-hmm. go outside mm-hmm. but i feel like wallowing i mean obviously having feelings of distress about living under putin are very valid but i feel like some russians are wallowing in that self pity and powerlessness too much because there are ways in which you can act against the regime for now and i feel like 
people should be taking hmm. i mean i like i'm not gonna be like put your life in danger while i'm here sitting in safety uh -huh. but i would say that like everyone who's against putin has like a is uh I forgot the word in English. Uh, has a duty. Has a duty to speak out in ways that they can that are safe, because if everyone is silent and self pitying, and is like, "We deserve pity too. We deserve compassion too." Like, no, like that's bad rhetoric. You are not being bombed. Excellent. Unless reminder, you're actually yeah. being beat up by Amon, then you deserve sympathy. But yeah, like yeah. you're sitting in your living room being like, oh no, I can't go to vacation in Italy anymore. And like I can't buy Chanel anymore. Like right. shut up. There's nothing to, to empathize with there. Yeah. I see. Um yeah, and, and Helen, do you have something else to add to? Yeah, I haven't faced any, you know, discrimination based on my nationality here in the United States. And I feel like this is also like one of the what one of the reasons why is that we are in New York City and this is a very liberal state with the people who are very, you know, they, mm -hmm. they're very knowledgeable about what's happening. Um, but what Paulina mentioned, the example that they had was um, one, uh, my, so one of my friends, he was in Latvia when that happened and he's, uh, he's, dad basically he has a car with the the russian uh flag so, not not with the flag but with the uh, number on the car that's license like, plate yeah mm -hmm. license plate and um they some people they put a sticker on the car that said ruski karabul idinakui which means russian military ship go and fuck yourself which is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something that, and I, f I feel like uh, uh, Russians who are in Eastern Europe right now as well as in Western Europe um, they do face some you know weird attacks that you know and you know the problem is that I feel like the this like the Russian government basically uses these few cases to you know kind of like to blow them up and to show that oh you know we we are hated by the whole world look 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 at yeah. this you know rotten west what they're doing mm -hmm. good and good yeah good point mm -hmm. this is like the biggest problem uh, I think in the Russian society that basically there is this actual belief that actually I was also influenced by when I was younger that people in the West hate us that you know and it's not to say that you know people in the West love us absolutely nothing like that but it's not like you know the moment you say that you are from Russia people you know just you know want to kill you or shoot you this is not how things work and Speaking of, you know, the difference between Trump's uh, regime and Biden's regime was that when I came to New York, when Trump was the president, basically the moment I said, oh, I'm Russian, people were like, oh, so do you support Putin? Uh, you, you're a communist, right? And this happened in New York City. Well, after I came to New York, when Biden became uh, your president, then people stopped asking these questions. And I feel like with Trump, basically people cannot help but be influenced by his rhetoric. And there was anti-Russian rhetoric when Trump was the president, not to say that there is no anti-Russian rhetoric when, uh, when we have Biden here, but at the same time, I feel like people had more audacity to, you know, kind of like ask this, you know, actual stupid questions and I feel like you know people understood that those feel like stupid questions but they just you know mm -hmm. wanted to you know see how this whole situation might escalate if they ask these questions mm -hmm. well I, I want to take a moment to say that if you're watching from Russia and you want to ask a question but you do not want to be named then I'm more than willing to ask your question without naming you um I wanted to sort of have a have a sense for um, what your 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 if you're willing to kind of what your family and friends are are thinking about the near future. Um, 
how are they going to, uh, where are they again, and and how are they coping with what's happening? Um, are they planning on moving, for instance, uh, or staying put? Have they had to move already? Uh, Paulina? Um, my parents are definitely staying, firstly, because there's the issue of my grandma, who, mm -hmm. like, she has heart, not heart issues, but, like, blood vessel issues. Basically, like, it's not very safe for her to, like, she would Travel. not feel very mm -hmm. comfy to be on, like, a long flight, A, and be mm -hmm. moving a six-year-old, actually, no, she's 70, 70-year-old person with who's, all of whose, like, friends and connections are in Russia to, like, a different place is... I see. ...cruel. And mm -hmm. also because, well, my parents aren't being actively pursued by the government. And also, additionally, my mom... Um, is basically used to be a partner at PwC, which was one of the consulting companies that left Russia because obviously no one wants to pay taxes um, so that they can go to fund the war that they're against. But basically, she's currently responsible for... Because like now like the people that were partners in Russia are responsible for the... People, like for like thousands of people, not losing their jobs so she can't like she feels very responsible for all of the like russian employees that used to work for this company and it's like a big uh -huh. company with yeah. offices in multiple russian cities so she's basically been working like 20 like 20 hour work days um because wow. they're trying to figure out what to do and this we had this discussion because i was like trying to encourage her to like uh, be more vocal about her like her being anti-war and this was like even before all of the like all of the laws because like every day they issue a new law that like prevents you from doing something yeah she said that she can't like that she can't go to prison because the entire family rests on her and that all of these people that the company employs yeah are relying on her for right keeping but their that, jobs in a country mm -hmm. that's about to run out of money so but that's yeah. that's that's just it right those are the kinds of decisions that people are having to make as a result of this and they're they're extremely difficult decisions to make um helen well one of my, uh one of my brother's businesses just you know got shut down because of the situation and um, but at the same time, you know, like my mom and my brother, they are staying in Russia and they're planning to stay there because basically they have nowhere to go, to be honest, because it's, it's very difficult to go anywhere from Russia right now, especially if you have a Russian citizenship. At the same time, uh, some of my friends who are my age in Russia uh, and they are students in one university in St. Petersburg, uh, they are planning to leave Russia and they are planning to, you know, move to the uh, United Kingdom and to pursue some sort of, you know, career there um, because they're good, uh, good at computer science. And so they're planning, you know, to stay on this track and, you know, try to see what they can do there. But especially, I feel like the younger generation, like our generation, um, they're definitely thinking of, you know, leaving Russia and th there will be a huge brain drain from Russia uh, because of this. And this is also to say that Putin can use it as a tool to, you know, stay in power because all of the people who have something against him, they are living or they're either living in fear and they're like silence or they are living and then, you know, they can, you know, express their opinions, not in Russia, but that obviously is not going to affect Putin in any, you know, significant way yes well i think um it's important as as Paulino was pointing out to of course remember uh the atrocities in ukraine above all else right and and what you've done here today has given us a sense for the other side of the equation and that that is the other people who are being affected by it and how it kind of 
got to this point, right? Uh, these kinds of these kinds of atrocities are a matter of years and and decades, and even in Russia's case, centuries in the making. Um, and it's incredible! It's incredible how brave you've been. It's incredible that English is not your first language, and you've handled everything as well as you've handled it. Uh, I just want to ask one final question, if I if I may, and then we'll bring it to a close. Um, what are the ways that you see, uh, I'll start with Polina because she brought it up, that, that Russians can protest without um, compromising their, themselves and their families, so, like you're doing right now, but from abroad, are there other things that they could be doing from within? I mean, there's a very popular, um, I mean, I don't know if it's, I, I just, I follow a lot of like activist channels. So to me, it seems like they're very popular ways, but maybe they're not like, that popular people will because it's not criminal to maybe it's criminal to write on money but they can't trace you to it for now i see because it because of it, it yeah circulates you get your message around and you, yeah it's not and traceable technically the like the cashiers and the vendors are not allowed to reject like a bill that's like corrupted as long as you can still like pay with it so if uh -huh. you have been withdrawing money from the ATMs of writing on them and putting them back into maybe like a different ADM just to be safer. Uh, mm -hmm. So wow. that's been one of the things. There's an entire like website that publishes methods of protest and like how safe they are. Also, people have been protesting um, the victims of Mariupol and Bucha by putting up like basically crosses in the like. I guess in like um the courtyards in what the courtyards or yeah yeah in the courtyards like they've been putting up like crosses to commemorate the victims of Putin's genocide in Bucha, for example. And things, yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but that's been more dangerous I've actually heard of people being arrested like the worst thing is that people will see you do that from their window and will snitch on you. So we're really back to like Stalinist era where you can't even trust like your neighbors, like your neighbors will be listening in on the other end of the wall and will like report you. Uh, but also like just in general, like sharing information, like for now you can't go to prison for sending your relative a link to a video that debunks like Putin's... Uh, propaganda unless like an fsb officer searches your phone mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so like obviously there's always like a oh but this can happen but it's like it's like again i feel like they want you to live in fear and like trying to manage that fear is in itself already an act of protest but also like also, like, just, like, right, starting, like, personal conversations with people is also an option. There are, like, many things a person can do, especially younger people, for example, in, like, universities where you will have, like, a range of people of different political opinions with whom you can, like, obviously that's also dangerous because you don't know if the person is going to report you or no, but if the person seems like they're, like, mm -hmm. not extremely pro Putin and will not like report you for trying to convince them in something is else. That, is it do you have the, the name of that website on hand? Uh okay wait let me you could find it yeah yeah uh, and just tell it to us. Helen what would you say? I would say that the biggest and the most significant in my opinion thing one can do in Russia right now is to basically try to change other people's opinions on what's happening because for example like I know that this happens in people's families in, in my friends families that I know it's very difficult when you know you you have like a, a your, your basically your political views and your parents' political views are not the same, and it's it's it becomes even more difficult when your parents don't want to listen to your arguments. But I think it's important to you know like slowly and carefully find the right words to yes. kind of like persuade these people and to you know show them that you know 
what critical thinking means because I cannot help but emphasize how important critical thinking is, especially for, you know, people in Russia who clearly lack it at the moment. Well, I would, I would agree with that. And I would say that in my attempts to have, have similar but still very different conversations, the important thing for me has been to remember not to, not to try to convince people that they're wrong, but to show them that you care, right? I mean, in other words, I, I keep thinking of, um, um, name escapes me at this very moment, um, Maya Angelou, who says, people don't remember what you said, or <laughs> sometimes not what you did, but they will always remember how you felt, how they felt when they were around you, right? And that's a paraphrase, it's not her exact words. I think that's some that's something important in those conversations because otherwise people just dig in harder and pull further and further apart, right? I, it's interesting. I, I I went to end on this note. I mean, in a way, it's amazing how different things are here. Yesterday was a historic day and an amazing day with uh, Kentaji Brown Jackson being not, um, officially nominated to uh, 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 being official uh, officially named the Supreme Court newest Supreme Court justice, the first Black woman in history. It's a kind of grim contrast in a way, but it's a really wonderful thing to celebrate here. Uh, and I'll give us that to to leave with. Please be in touch with uh, me by email. You can either look me up on. Um, uh, the website, uh, our faculty website at Fordham, uh, or I have my own website, michaelosorgan.com. Um, I want to express thanks to our attendees who contribute so much to our discussions, but also in this particular case, who showed up uh, from, from Russia and, and listened and participated. I greatly appreciate that. Uh, the, I'd like to thank the co-directors of the Orthodox Christian Study Center for providing the platform to, to discuss these extremely important things and allowing Pauline and Helen to share their fascinating opinions and stories. Um, I would like to uh, uh, thank the associate director, Nathaniel Wood, who is also the managing editor, editor of the Study Center's publication of scholarly research called Public Orthodoxy. Uh, if that interests you, we also have a lot of articles on the role of orthodoxy in this war, uh, which is complex and worth looking into. Um, and I would like to give special thanks to Siobhan uh, Verlesa for making this emergency special session possible. Uh, I can't express my thanks enough to you, uh, your, your intelligence and your, your bravery and uh, your willingness to speak out. Um, thank you so much, Helen and, and Paulina. I hope that we get to study uh, great Russian works uh, again soon. Thank you. Thank you.